Welcome back, everybody, to the C-Mask podcast. Back again with Will, Mike, and Tim. And today we are discussing one of my favorite topics, which is love. And as some of you may know, I run a Catholic matchmaking service with the intrepid patriarchs, Will and Tim. Uh, we are coming up on our second wedding. First wedding's very soon, second wedding uh, seems to be in the works and lots of stable, steady couples right now, which is something that brings me a lot of joy. And uh, so today I wanted to discuss how men are actually the architects of romance, despite culture for the last 50 to 75 years trying to convince us all that it is in fact women who are the arbiters and architects of all romance. Um, so to start this out, uh, we'll just go Will, Mike, and then Tim, when did you notice this to be true? Have you noticed this to be true, that men are, in fact, the architects of romance? Well, first up, I'm not sure I even know what the word romance means, but in terms of being the initiators and controlling how love develops, the man certainly plays the active role, and you even see this in the animal kingdom, with little insects bringing nuptial gifts to kick things off. So even our tiny critter friends know this to be true, <laughs> what Nick is saying. And the man has to have the plan, whether you are a human or whether you are a beetle. And guys have missed out on this over the last few decades. And it's because I think it's another symptom of not knowing really what they want out of life, not having the confidence to go up and approach a girl and tell her what they're going to be doing on the date, not having the confidence to make a move. And part of that, I think, like we talked about in previous episodes, is actually a a concern rooted in pride that they might look silly. It's like, you're already pretty silly, sillier than you realize. So you may as well just go for it. Okay, so Mike, before you answer when you realized what, who the architects of romance were. Help us help us define romance then. Help help you define romance? Yeah, Will says Will says he doesn't know what romance is. I realize that's probably a good thing to start with. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's let's define that. Let's Mike's define like, that. dude, you're you're not coming on to me, are you? <laughs> yeah. <it's> like, <laughs> you know we're recording, right? So how yeah. how would you define in this within the context of this podcast, how would you define romance? Because that's a, it can be a Skittles term in the modern in the modern day as we know. Yeah, or or a um, an Old Testament vibe because of Disney and rom coms and Judd Apatow and Adam Sandler being the uh, the screenwriters of the last forty years of of what we consider to be romance. Um, yeah, I would just say the creating the conditions for the possibility of love. Um, in in more of the the interpersonal or or social settings, not not having to do with virtue explicitly, not having to do with um, necessarily even character traits, but more of the situational or environmental things that that inspire uh, love itself. You know, so that would be dating circumstances buying gifts not buying gifts taking women to places um gestures of affection all, all sorts of things like that which you know culturally now we are we have it in our head it's like you buy flowers on the first date on valentine's day they get a heart-shaped box full of chocolates and you know you need flower petals on a mattress to make love and all these things and like that's that's sort of the cultural thing, but I'm just referring to the the general pulling of the strings to to manifest intimacy. I think it's it's much like uh, masculinity um, in the sense that it's aspirational. I think that's why guys are like the you know you know the the, the true romantics. You know, we strive, we aspire uh, for uh, Christ likeness. We never quite get fully there, of course, because we're we're fallen creatures. We all aspire or, you know, fantasize dying in battle or, you know, uh, uh, defending or protecting our family. We're kind of idealists in that way. Um, 
so men being the 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 true romantics it's it's kind of one of those things where a man has this idea of what he wants his his family life to look like and <clears throat> i think that's been so flipped on its head too because you know the guys have been uh, bred to believe we live in a gynocentric world order and this the matriarchal society which in part is true and so that that man in motion striving to initiate and impose his will upon sort of the romantic landscape and finding that, you know, potential wife and creating that, you know, ideal situation for a family is kind of lost. Um, but I, I, I think it's much like, you know, um, masculinity and virtue and Christ likeness where it's, it's aspirational. We have this like fantasy in our head and we're striving toward it, or at least that's how I, um, understand romance you know when I met my wife all these images and these 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 ideas of what our future would look like instantly came into my head and like my actions you know proceeded from that um, which I, I think is somewhat rare nowadays because most guys are kind of like oh you know sh that girl's too hot she probably gets approached all the time I'm just going to sit here and, and swipe on these apps and it's kind of created this like numb passivity around the idea of that aspirational romance and uh, marital situation the uh, I think the most salient aspect of what you just said was the idea of vision. Like mm -hmm. men have men have vision for the future, but they're also probably the only ones who can. Like women don't think spatially, they don't think proprioceptively. This is why it's a horrible idea for women to drive or <laughs> you know, even if you're like walking in a <laughs> grocery store, uh you, you might pick up on what I'm putting down here but yeah but the idea of vision thinking through scenarios in the future and um even ironically enough empathy too like there's there's a it sounds like from what you're saying that there's a necessity for empathy that men have which is i think once again culturally described as men not having empathy but in order to do what you're describing to like visualize what the future experiences with your wife might be in some kind of romantic gesture you have to like be able to resonate with what she might feel like in that situation which is by definition mm -hmm. empathy itself so there's like so much vision that's required that seems to be unique to the masculine soul the masculine mind itself tim what do you think all this is right i especially i mean i resonate with all of it i'm um I was making this point a few months ago and I was like, you know, it's like something in the the culture pushed the, the Anglo American culture pushed us towards saying, Oh, women are better communicators. No, they're not that. I mean, this is not true. They're look at the great novelists of all time. There's, there are no women in the top 10 list. I mean, um, you know, people might throw in Jane Austen. I don't, I don't find that such a stretch, but you talk about the top 50 authors of all time. They're not, they're all male. Um, and that's not just expression of mathematics or like, because there's expressive and there's receptive forms of language in the brain. There are actually three parts of language in the brain. And there's, there's expressive receptive and one that's expressive dash receptive we're talking about the expression of life and death, um, God and the devil, good and bad, um, suffering and redemption. Think about reading a Dostoevsky novel. These are the kinds of expressions that are supposed to make people feel boggy and cry, and maybe eventually cry. This is very male. And then I, I think about um, this kind of hijack in the context of, um, women are natural romantics. No, it's more, it's just not true. Like if you're, people that are always talking about, oh, we stayed up all night talking, that's more a guy thing to to um, be romantic in the sense of romanticism, like the the literary movement, to dispense with, well, it's, it, we're going to feel kind of tired in the morning. We both, both might have headaches or we both have busy days. But if this is like a first date and you, it's great. And you don't want to leave it. It's always the guy that's like, that's fine. I'll deal with the suffering that follows upon the rational suffering is a rational consequence that follows from doing something quote unquote romantic, just living in the moment. Um, and so I'm, I'm taking a lot of these cues from the romanticist movement. 
and some of them are kind of fruity, but, but there is something to the, the willingness to suffer for the sake of like a beautiful moment is again, uniquely male women are more like, Oh yeah, well, I, I, you know, I was getting sleepy. So I, I went to sleep. Typically men will be like, well, I was sleepy, but I, I was enjoying every moment with her. And of course there's differences person <laughs> to person, but this does touch on what you said about compassion too. Men are typically the ones where if you're like, you know, bro, I'm really worried about this. Will you stay on the phone with me all night long? Your bro will be like, yeah, well, um, women typically will be flustered, um, overwhelmed <laughs> by by expressions of like, oh, I, I I thought men never got worried, you know? So so there is something to the expression of deep sentiment, compassion, romance in the sense of the romantics that needs to be part of men because we're the active principle they're the passive principle we're the expressive principle they're the receptive principle so it all just gels with everything else that we've always said on this show and that um we, we will's written about i've written about I, it's it's just a weird hijacking to say that women are not only the kind of ones that get to enjoy the spoils of the activity expressivity because they are they're passive and receptive of just our overtures but they also are the more romantic ones. That's it's like guys just have the worst of all worlds in our day. But women are not natural romantics. They're more, you know, nesters geared toward comforts and um, not giving up those comforts even for the sake of a, a beautiful moment. I'm not saying there aren't girls that are willing to do it. I'm saying by nature, by average, yep. easily, it's teleologically male. And women are also built to detect uh, male weakness and find the stress spots in a way that men can't really imagine because this is really important. It benefits children. So when you're courting, the woman is picking up on all kinds of social cues that tell her about you as a man and your integrity. And that's not a very romantic thing to be doing. It's not like lovey dovey and mushy and living in fantasy. It's, Oh, this guy has got really poor stress tolerance and he's socially awkward and I can't really depend on him. Next, and you can think of this yeah. in the fairy tale as being the the princess in the tower, just watching from the window while prince after prince gets killed by the dragon. Next, 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 until one comes along and he makes it through and he's passed the test. So that's not a romantic thing either. The bodies yeah. just pile up and then one guy makes it. Women like, okay. are, men become, can be pretty much summed up in that statement yeah. right there. Yeah. <clears throat> Tim, what were you saying? Oh, I was just adding to his point. I was like, they, they just watch and they're like, okay, I guess I'll go with this guy now. He, He's good enough. And yeah. there is something to that. I mean, we, we've been the defenders of Christian matrimony. Thank you, Steffi. If Steph bring, romantically brings me my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> we've won. Thank Please. you. <clears throat> I love you. <laughs> uh, we've long been the defenders on this podcast against red pill incursions against marriage and family and at times people have mistaken this for our podcast rollo knows it now after our de debate or whatever but we're not we're not defending the gynocentrism and and so you're gonna hear it more in this episode. Like, Steffi, this episode's about how women women really aren't romantic. Oh, so true. They're practical and and boring, right? And like, 100%. <laughs> and and Will just said, sort of, sort of, like even the best ones are sort of geared toward. Um, I think something Nick called yesterday at my house after I got in my car accident. Um, it wasn't a real car accident, like a high disgust threshold that Steph and I were laughing about. We were talking about yeah, something low, else or a low disgust, low disgust, low disgust. sensitivity. Yeah. yeah where they're like they get the ick so fast. Like you hear, you hear these clips on, you know, Joe Rogan will be interviewing some woman and her, her boyfriend is a, an MMA fighter. And she'll describe how the way his head bounced off the canvas when he got knocked off, gave her the ick. Yeah. That's. 
That's of course probably <laughs> the difference between a qual a, a low quality woman and a high quality woman. Sure, but sure, that's the that's the left bound extreme. But they think the Overton window has shifted in that direction where where women just do really have a low disgust or sensitivity. That, yeah, the, that quarterback documentary. It's called Quarterback on um, Netflix. Remember Steph Brit Brittany Mahomes? How does Brittany Mahomes sound? She'd be in the right. stands. Patrick Mahomes would get tackled hard, and she'd be like. Can you do the Steph has a good Brittany Mahomes impression? She's like, oh my gosh, did you see his leg? It bent the wrong way. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> He's into the ground. It's so disgusting. Yeah. 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 That's not it's, romantic. Yeah, romantic so, is like it, yeah, go ahead. Well, just this this brings up the the primary balancing act that I wanted to jump into for this episode, um, which is okay, if men are the arbiters and architects of, of true romance and sentimentality. There's a tension that arises between simping the left bound of this and true romance, masculine romanticism, um, something that would attract a woman and keep her there and not, and never give her this ick. Right. So far left side, if you screw it up, she gets the ick you're emasculated far right side. She falls madly in love with you and you live happily ever after. And so I, I think simping inherently comes from a place of self-loathing, whereas romance probably comes from a place of self-possession and self-esteem. Yeah. With, with simping, you're going to be trying to purchase affections because with, with some mechanism besides your own character, or your own virtue. And with self-esteem driven romance, it's more of a presentation of yourself and you understand that, that that is what's attractive. And it's just various expressions of, you know, your character, whether it's it's joking or the the artifice of a date of some kind, um, or the situation or the movie that you select, um, the music that you put on in the environment itself. This is all expressions of of you and like the the assurance that you have in yourself that, okay, this is in fact something that she's going to find attractive or she should find attractive. Um, I used then, to talk this about this why... a lot. Oh, sorry, Nick. No, 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 I, was no, gonna say, I used to talk about this a lot when I was teaching in the classroom with the great Gatsby. I don't know if you guys know that yeah, novel, that. but it's a good yeah. one for people to look at uh, because yeah. Uh, yeah. Gatsby is basically the, the simp in his purest form. Yeah. Because he yeah. crafts his entire life just to try and impress Daisy. And Denny de Rougemont wrote a book called Love in the Western World, where he contrasts romance or passion um, to love and talks about romance as being in love with love. And it depends on obstacles and they fuel it. And it just becomes this fantasy that sucks the uh, romantic into it further and further. And when Gatsby finally gets face to face with Daisy and realizes this is a real flesh and blood woman, um, Fitzgerald says that his count of enchanted objects had diminished by one because right. reality has shattered the fantasy, especially when he sees that Daisy, in fact, has a child with Tom, her <laughs> husband. He can't compute that. She's a mother. She's not just a fiction of his imagination. So it's interesting to think about the the origins of romance with the the troubadour poets, who were basically guys who had fallen in love almost always with a married woman that they were never going to be able to be with, uh, but they loved that feeling of inaccessibility, and the woman became the thing that they organized their lives around. So it's really a form of idolatry. Whereas what we it want, is. as Nick's suggesting, is the man doesn't say, "Look at my life, babe." I did it all for you. It was all for you. You're doing it all for the glory of God. That's the masculine thing to do. That's frame control. And then the woman admires that. You don't do it all for her. Yeah. I'll just and jump in on that point, Nick, about simping versus romance. And this is something I get into a lot with the guys that I coach, is that it's it comes down to outcome dependence versus outcome independence. Mm -hmm. And so when a man is giving because his cup overflows it's completely different than a man um, giving in order to receive because his cup is empty. I heard, I've heard from a lot of married men and men that are dating 
Now, you know, when I go to be affectionate with my wife or this girl, it's almost like repulses her. It's like, yeah, because you're you're giving her affection to receive affection in return. She mm. can understand the difference physiologically between those two things. When I go and embrace my wife and I want to, you know, um, you know, overwhelm her with my presence, I'm doing it not because I want to get validated from her, but because I just want to do it. And that's a, there's a subtle difference there. But to a woman they may not, not be able to properly communicate it, but it's a massive, massive difference to them. They they, they can't put their finger on it. And nor should they be able to. F fastest way to get bitten by a serious dog breed is to give it too much affection. You know that? Boom. Mm. Boom. Really? Yep. W women work the same way, I think. There's another woman dog comparison there. <laughs> too much affection is a bad thing. Just a couple of bitches. <laughs> <laughs> For real though, uh, it was yes. an analogy, not a not a species to genus. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about we're just talking about the pups. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, the other interesting thing about the idolatry point you made about Gatsby is he changes his whole name from James Gats to um, you know sounding like a record producer or something to Jay Gatsby. God is supposed to change the name as a sign of some covenant of of the individual this guy literally changes his own name because he has this american idol of uh the golden girl uh daisy and and so that that's that's proper idolatry to have changed yeah. his own name all around the fise idea you know the fixed point of daisy i also is this stuff this intellectual stuff rubber meets the road affections are really important one particularly in marriage even in healthy marriages, it's like, yeah, how do you, how do you keep the affection loop really open? So I, I appreciate Mike's point there. Before marriage, the number one thing I see men doing on dates too much is trying. It, it reminds me of a Frasier episode where he said, you know, setting the music, coming up with interesting activities. Uh, you said you like painting, so I painted you a painting about painting. All this bullshit. <laughs> what a really, I think what a really confident man does is sets a date. It's dinner and maybe a movie. My presence is going to be interesting. I'm going to be funny. I'm going to be charming. But I did not rent a special chariot, a special like motor coach or whatever, a, a car for you. I did not do anything. I, I'm presenting myself, and it's good when you're trying to dress yourself up so much simping i mean you look nice on a date gentlemen but but when you're trying to dress up your life in garb that is unrealistic and and for a first date you nick you even mentioned bring flowers never bring flowers on a first date never ever steph's saying oh no you present Can yourself you, you look nice yeah you are you the flowers nice. <laughs> what <laughs> you are the flowers <laughs> You're the flowers. Yeah. Never, <laughs> ever. This is important. I tell guys in the return thing, like that's simping, bro. That's not romance. Romance is yeah. you end up giving your life for your wife of, I don't know, 20 years, the band, a uh, pack of bandits on the road. Romance is not what you do for some stranger that you're meeting for the first time on a first date. You can't, those flowers are inherently Mike's um, expression of, um, intimacy or uh, wanting a hug affection for the sake of getting something back like what what is it I, i'm just meeting you for the first time why am i giving you flowers i don't even know if we're going to have a connection right giving something right. to your wife right. where you go to the go all the way to the you know the end of the road for her that that's beautiful but people, this is way way important how to express romance so last point of clarification on simping and then I want to get into somewhat of a rapid fire, maybe just because I know this is a, a shorter episode of situations and you all can give your your takes on each individual premise or situation through the lens of true romance, true masculine romance and simping. So last point on simping is uh, on the subject of idolatry. Um, it's there's the self abnegation, right? The self sacrifice uh, to the deity, which is the woman. And um, humility being seeing yourself as God sees you also means you should see the woman as God sees her. And so to deify through self-abnegation in that way is 
is that idolatry that Will was describing. So I'm going to start it off with one that I already know there's a bit of contentiousness with between Team Tickleus, Timothy and Nicholas, and Team Forklift. I actually don't know where Mike stands on this, but <laughs> I know where Will stands on this. So wedding rings. We have Team Edmund Dantes here with Tickleus of saying that, you know, a string and a prayer and uh, a doughy eyed gaze into your lover's eyes is sufficient. And Mr. Noland, three months of a man's salary to demonstrate fortitude and economic provisional capacity. Duke it out, gentlemen. What a, what's what's the rule on wedding rings? Do you propose with the ring? Do you propose and then get the ring? And how much should it cost? What you can afford is something that's going to be on her finger for the rest of her life. I'd rather buy nice than buy twice. And if it's a guy who's getting married young, I would say get a summer job from age like 17, 18, 19. Save that. That's your three months. And then you're going to be able to afford a half decent ring with that. Probably not what a guy who's in his mid-20s could get, but it'll be good enough that you can be proud of it and she can wear it for the rest of her life. Not that much money, a couple of grand probably. That's pretty solid. And then you go with that. If you're 35 and you're earning a lot of money, then a three months salary is going to be a much higher number for you. But it's still the same kind of gesture as the younger guy makes. And you're just penalizing yourself by that point for having wasted your age 20 to age 35. So you should be buying a more expensive ring, in my opinion. But yeah, what you can afford, and it's a significant purchase, so go for it. I'm in uh I'm in agreement with 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 Will here. I don't know if it should be three months, but what I like to say to guys is it should be enough that makes you uncomfortable when you go to buy it. You know, where you're you're handing that money down, you're like, oh gosh, yeah, you know, I don't know how to assign a number to that. Um, it could be a couple months, it could be a month, I'm not sure. But it's almost like a slight, what are you comfortable with? Stretch yourself out a little bit further. And another thing too, it's guys, um, try to understand what she likes in a ring as well. You are not going to be able to make the right choice without that kind of idea beforehand. <laughs> so I know me and my wife kind of discussed it a little bit and, you know, she had sent me pictures of stuff that she really liked. And I kind of took note over time without it making it completely obvious and get her ring or her finger sized gentleman to propose with the ring. Um, you know, when you purchase it, make sure it stings a little bit. It's an un it's uncomfortable. Um, because when you whip that thing out, you want her to have that, like, oh my God. And I have it ring? on camera. <laughs> I worded that on purpose, both. And so I remember setting up my my camera in my gym when I proposed to my wife in in, in my gym in Vancouver. And it was funny. As soon as I got on a knee and I, I, I presented the ring, it was like, she was like taking it back. Oh my God. I'm like, yeah, well, that's the reaction I was going for. <laughs> it may be uncomfortable. I knew what she liked. I got her finger size and I just went for it. <laughs> what, what you don't want is for her to see that you've got all kinds of material possessions related to your own hobbies that you've spent way more on than the ring. Because True. that just signals something to her. The amount of women who told me things like, yeah, he's, he bought himself this yacht or he's got this truck. And when it was something for him, it was just, he went all out. But the ring is there as a reminder that that wasn't a priority. So just be careful about what you're signaling. Now the counterpoint, Timothy, you did not. Uh, also, it's also legitimately first and only uh, disagreement on the CMAS panel. Like the <laughs> legitimate disagreement. I always like, man. Mike, uh, Will can, Will can speak for him. Mike too. Yeah. You could give pretty much give a, give a, a Tim answer at any time. And I know what it is. So this is, this is legitimate. Cause I'm, I'm trenched in the other way. I believe that, uh, that young men should propose the moment that they have substantial certitude that they want to get married and start the process, um, get married as young as is feasible on a rational basis you know once you find out you have the right person then just go for it short short of as short an engagement as can be arranged and get to the engagement as brief a period as you can epistemically um vouchsafe it so 
um, this just in the modern arrangement, people talking about the being being stretched economically, um, but for two income trap, is it okay to you know have two incomes? No, no. But young men who are, if we're talking just out of high school, which is when I really want to push people to getting married again, um, to their high school sweethearts, the idea of this doesn't doesn't sit practically, but but by principle, um, it's a it's a gift, and the idea of I, I rewatched um, Lone Survivor last night because that's how I felt all day after the skateboard thing. They they open up with these macho guys, you know, the the Navy SEALs all talking about as they're waking mm -hmm. up at the beginning, all talking about uh, he has to get his fiance an Arabian horse for a present. What? No, the present is yourself. The present is you pledge your life and your protection to this person. Now, I'm not against the cultural leitmotif of, of an engagement ring. Um, that's an extra present. Women get a wedding ring and an engagement ring. Men get just a wedding ring. Um, so we get them an extra engagement ring. I'm not against that. But I, I think, I mean, if anything, you want a nice looking one, but to start talking about, um, well, you have to buy an Arabian horse in addition <laughs> to these, these, um, to all the, the cultural light motifs, we're missing the point as to what the present is. And for women to get the, a beautiful diamond, diamonds are a girl's best friend. I mean, I, I, I went solitaire, but Steph and I went in and picked that out together. The minute I had substantial certitude that I, this, this is where I want to go with my life. The, the real, so you asked, you asked, and then you went to get the the ring. That moment, yeah, I was like, I just it just dawned on me. I I was always someone that was worried about how will I know, and I, I dated a lot in college, and I'm just like, I I know I know with with you now, Steph. Let's just go get. And I proposed without a ring. I was like, let's go pick one out, and um, it was great, and and we love it. And she loves it. And the funny thing is she she, lo she lost it down the garbage disposal a few months ago, five months back. And um, other women would have been like, oh, well, that that's fine. I'll just replace it with a bigger diamond now that we have more wealth. And she was like, I don't want anything but that what what other oh, my older tackier relatives um, called her once a starter ring. She's like, I don't want any. It's a beautiful little diamond. This is all I want in the whole world. She's like, you can't replace this thing with $10,000. The most romantic thing I've done in the last year is I found it out of the drain. I dumped <laughs> out, I jumped out the, uh, what's that called? The U-bend in the, the drain. Trap. There was some, yeah, yeah, the trap in the U-bend there. And the sediment came out and it was all covered in muck. And I just put my hand in there. I was like, this is a one-time <laughs> shot. Because it, it was a shallow U-bend. So if the water had been enough to carry it over there, that thing would have been gone forever. The diamond popped out and it, I put my finger in there and I, I felt the pebble and I was like, this is so amazing. And Steph had been crying all night. I'd gotten back from a basketball game. It was amazing. So I think, I think I like reproposed. Yeah. Th this thing, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful ring. I just, uh, yeah, Steffi, it's, it's her tr prized possession, of course. And I just feel like making a conditions on a gift feels I'm I'm sensitive to gratefulness and gratitude. And if you start conditioning a gift, it's gotta be this, it's gotta be this, it's gotta be this. It's like I it just makes me go the other way. So this is the one issue. I strongly feel the other way. I, it makes it's very unromantic in my view, since this is on romance, to be like, well, I want you to get me a, a birthday gift, but it's gotta be this, 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 and this. <laughs> yeah. That's how yeah. That 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 went about exactly as I expected. Um, I I do want to move past it just because there's two other points that I want to hit that I think are equivalently valuable on the subject of romance. Um, the first is the eternal balancing act of stoicism and vulnerability. Women want men to be vulnerable. I want you to tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you're feeling. How, you know, just, I just want you to be able to share everything with me. And the sort of boomer characterization of the, the father who doesn't speak, you know, who doesn't emote 
Um, and there's there's somewhere in between there that's that's probably a golden mean. But just you, y'all's two cents on this going through. Will you say, men, you you're allowed one singular tear across the not even one, not, not even, even one. one. <laughs> oh, I thought at the wedding, I thought at the wedding you were allowed to have one tear. Well, if, if it's silent um, and no I mean, one sees one one tear, you can get away with. But you shouldn't okay. be breaking it down in front of everyone at the wedding. I don't like that. I agree All with right. that. That's a bit, yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. Sure. No, I Will, don't like how... a tear at the wedding. You should be happy at your wedding. Come on. <laughs> Will, how much how much are you opening up to your dearly beloved? What does that look like for you? So I recommend that guys share what they're excited about, what their hopes and plans are, and what they're really pumped up to be working on, because that's good in the way that your wife knows that you've got drive, focus, motivation, ambition, etc. I don't recommend that you whine and complain and offload stress onto her, especially when it's stuff that is not really her problem to deal with. It's on you to fix. That's not a pleasant thing to be around for anybody. I don't like being around guys that whine at me either. If I can fix a problem for them, great. But most of the time, it's their thing that needed to handle. So you should be speaking to your wife about what you're excited about and what the future for the two of you holds. But don't use her as a stress sponge where you just moan about your problems in life. I don't think that's helpful for her to have to endure day in, day out. Um, you can mess things up. I've seen guys do it by thinking that they have to be like really cold hearted and never show any kind of emotion at all. That's not a sensible approach. Uh, St. Augustine makes the point, writing against the Stoics, that not to be sad when a loved one dies is to be less than fully human. And you got to bear that in mind in marriage as well. You, you are a human being, you do have emotions, and they are prompts to action. And that's the way that God designed human nature. So don't pretend you're something other than what you are. But be careful about what kind of emotions you are acting on because you need to keep them under control. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I resonate with all that. Mike, what do you say? Yeah, I think the, the the key word is control and calibration. It's it's okay to experience emotions allow, as long, so long as they don't rule over you. Um, I agree with Will in that, you know, I, for the majority of the time, share my passions, my excitement, visions for the future with my wife and kind of bring her into that vision with me, of course. She's my best friend. She's seen me through so many different seasons of life. And I think whining and complaining about life is just fundamentally an unattractive trait. Um, I, just like Will said, I don't want to be around bros that do that. Like sometimes, you know, you got to quote unquote, and this is very, I think seldomly men should do this vent. I think venting is a pretty like G-A-Y trait, to be completely honest. I don't think we need to vent. I think we need to like sublimate and go do do something and 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 put that energy towards something else. Um, but I think there's been times where my wife has seen me in some pretty rough states. But I think the key difference here is is you can still handle, like you can still be in a rough patch the way that you communicate it even if in internally it feels like you're crumbling you just tell your wife you know because my wife's very intuitive she knows when i'm struggling with something she knows when i'm sad or i'm going through a bit of a low point and i'll just tell her say listen like i'm, I'm kind of going through something right now there's like a dark cloud i'm kind of going through a little darkness right now but it's, it's going to be okay it's going to be fine i'm praying through it i've got god i'm going through it right now but i'm good i've got a handle on it and so i don't think it's so much as a man can't show any emotion. It's, well, how are you doing it? Are you controlling it? Or are you allowing it to rule over you? Because a guy that's just like a bumbling, crying fool, uh, how does she feel safe in an environment like that? She can't. Yeah. Well, Tim, you and I, I think would agree on this. I'm sure Mike and Will would too. But in the same regard that men are the architects of romance, it's because men are better at everything, including, I would argue, feeling. Now, I think women are more emotive. Also, there's a lot of research to show that the more estrogen you have, the more you talk. And they definitely express what they feel with fewer steps, I think. But in terms of rationalizing or apprehending to the root and emotion, a, a situation, the cost of a situation or something, I think men do this far deeper. So with that in mind, then, if I were to reduce that to a phrase of like, well, men feel more technically, isn't it a little unfair that we're also supposed to express with more restraint? I don't think it's unfair. Uh, I agree with everything Mike and Wilson, per, per usual. 
back to back to normal. Um, <laughs> but it does. I will say this: it's marriage is the most beautiful life for me. I definitely knew, and and we get we get privileges and graces that priests don't. They have the higher, harder way. But um, and we get the more comfort and don't have to be celibate. So it's a beautiful life, but it's also a cross. And this is one of the crosses in marriage because um, as a as a as a profound person, all, all of us are like deep deep guys that feel things profoundly. And the paradox that you just described, Nick, that men tend to like Dostoevsky or or you know I don't know Theodore Dreiser or something, we well, feel feel things deeper and be able to express them deeper it feels a little bit like a cruel twist of fate that then we know that it's a fact wives are going to be turned off by um a wanton like willy-nilly expression of how you might be feeling sometimes but it's a fact and uh, it's a it's a hard fact it's one of the crosses you have to bear as a man is like heavy is the head that wears the crown and it is the man because sometimes you're like, I feel totally out of control. Let's just be honest. Some every once in a while, something happens, you know, once every couple of years, and you're like, I don't know how to handle this. I feel out of control. I feel actual fear. It's not not a common thing I walk around feeling, but um, and for me, it's it's when I'm if I'm going through a patch of um, like the hypochondria, um, once every Relate couple to that. couple, yeah. The, so it's not unfair fair but it feels unfair it's like i have to be as calm as i can and i'm not saying i've always passed this this is the only thing where i yeah i don't i don't believe in male tears i don't want to see male tears at a wedding or it, ever but man it can be hard sometimes so rather than just stand up here and be macho and say like you know you know it's unfair that we're in this situation, I would just say it's one of the crosses. America. It's for me, it's one of the trickier crosses. It, it, that rare once every two or three years, rough patch, dark cloud that Mike's talking about. It can be really bad, but you, you don't want to let. I have six little girls. I don't want to let them see me be worried. And I have a, well, a wor one of them's really a worrier, like I was when I was a little boy. I can't let her see that. And it's somewhat the same with Steph. So. It's just something to know that when you get into marriage, this is an actual difficulty. My my kids have got a joke that when we found out that I was getting sacked just before Christmas, that that I had one solitary tear that we we're losing the house and all the rest of it. And then before the tear hit the floor, my laptop was open and I was working on the next project. That's yeah. the bit they remember. <laughs> and uh, in the in the early interviews I had. A couple of people were saying, you know, have you got family wealth or something? You don't seem like you're too afraid of this, that you might be banned from your profession for life and your house is gone. You're going to be homeless. And I was worried about it. But what are you going to do? Sometimes that sort of stuff happens in life and you just have to keep putting one foot in front of the next because telling everyone you're worried isn't going to help anything. It'll just make them feel worse around you. So you just keep going forwards. Well, it seems to be something that would be abundantly attractive to a woman is if she can recognize in you that you have full apprehension of how bad it is and self-possession in that moment. So I think guys screw up one or the other. It's really bad and they co totally lose their heads or they just choose to not accept the, the gravity of the situation in an attempt at machismo. And it's, I think it's both of those at the same time. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think it comes down to exuding an energy of, if you were to really kind of put it in kind of blue collar terms, it's hard, babe, but I got this, that kind of vibe, that kind of energy where like you understand that the gravity and the difficulty, but you're prepared to handle it. And, and like with everything else, Christ did it best with the sweat of blood. Right. And people are going to say, yeah. listen to this. Oh, but Jesus wept. Jesus cries in the Bible. Yeah, over oh, bad things that are happening to other people. He's, he's, he's crying for you. He's not whining about himself. Mm -hmm. Even with the sweat of blood, it's about you. Also, I would just say that Aristotle intones it identically to how you did, Nick, that the, the brave man is not the one that doesn't fear the proper things. 
the brave man is the one who fears then braves the correct things to fear and brave yeah. so it's it's exactly yeah. what you said exactly so i would say two i want to offer two pieces of advice to women before moving on to uh, i think the most fun part of this subject two pieces of advice one uh, was passed on to me from uh, my friend chase not not sovereign bro chase different chase um i think it was his sister was getting married sister and their great grandmother uh, gave her a piece of advice on how to always be happy and not resent her husband. We'll call him Joe. It's not his name. How, when marrying Joe, can you live without resentment and being happy for a full marriage? And she's told Chase's sister, simply don't want anything he can't provide for you. That's it. If you don't think as a woman that you can do that, if that man won't be able to provide something for you that later in life you know now that you want, don't marry him. You will resent him. That's a piece of advice, number one. The second, Tim, you wanted to jump in on that? I just saw you unmute. Oh, okay, okay. Um, the second is whatever this low disgust sensitivity that has taken the West by storm and women, you will miss out on phenomenal men if that disgust sensitivity is too low have standards no one's saying don't have standards but everybody here i mean i didn't admit it but it's that's obviously true admitted to everything from a single tear to sometimes some dark clouds you know like shit's gonna get hard and if your disgust sensitivity is too low and you get the ick that's a you problem. That's a pride thing. That's a self-delusion thing. You are not humble. You don't see yourself as God sees you. And you will miss out on phenomenal husbands. Those are just two thoughts that I wanted to impart before moving to my favorite section of this, which is, all right, we described the principles. Uh, Tim, what's the difference between nomos and phusis again? Nature and convention. Um, yeah, okay. Convention. convention. Which one's convention? Uh, uh, nomos, nomos. Thank you. Okay. So, guys, we're not we're not saying that we are going to break principles here, Ephesus. But guys can break rules. We can we can break convention, and there was already a difference here with the wedding ring thing. The thing I'm most interested in is when you hold perfectly to the principle of self possession and not letting emotions or circumstances overwhelm you, then you kind of have some latitude to break the rules unique and specific to you as a man. Mm -hmm. So running through again, not violating these principles, what are some ways that you guys have expressed yourselves against the convention of what would be, what we would call cultural masculinity? Whoever wants to start, it doesn't have to be will. I know he's never broken a convention in his life. My wife has seen me go through uh, addiction um, and losing loved ones um, and going through, if you guys don't know, the the um, spiritual oppression of, of, of addiction, and particularly for me, it was alcohol. And by the grace of God, I mean, it's it's no longer a thing, praise Jesus, but she saw me go through that. And, and, you know, without harping too long about that, I tell guys too, the more that you build yourself, as, uh, build yourself up as a man, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, uh, provisionally within your finances and your business and whatnot, um, you have more leeway than a guy that's like this slope shouldered, skinny, fat nerd that's got nothing going for him besides a good job. Once you break frame, she's gonna have a lot less respect for you because you you haven't already built yourself up. You haven't conquered any kind of dragon, really. But when you've conquered right. your life, when you've imposed your will upon your life and you've achieved something, you have a tree that bears fruit. When you go through those seasons, a woman should have grace regardless, but she'll have more grace for you uh, when you built yourself up in such a way. And I think part of the reason my wife is beautiful hearted, kind person, way better than than than, than myself. Um, and she already possesses that trait, but she also knows because I, I built myself up in such a way, it was easier for her to have grace for me when going through those dark times. 
hopefully that addresses what you said. It's a great yeah. point. Nick, I've got two minutes. I want to be really quick. Uh, men are supposed to really care about social status and being popular and valued by other men. But numerous times I've been willing to lose that over sticking to a point of principle and endure social shaming and being ostracized. And that's something that some guys would not think is masculine, but actually it made my wife more attractive to me because it shows you're not willing to um, simp for fame in that way. So it can sting at the time, but in the long run, you know that's a guy who can actually uphold boundaries properly, which is a more important masculine trait. And you win the respect of the people that matter more than just the applause of the crowd. So that's the convention I've gone against. Tim, what do you got? Um, um, actually, I was going to mention a couple things, and it's it's Mike's thing, and then Will's thing in turn. I, <clears throat> mine is not an addiction, but um, I've already mentioned the hypochondria pops up once every couple of years ever since ever since Abby was really sick, and um, it's really true what Mike said that because I built up some capital, some sweat equity, and like you know doing hard things and not caring. I, I drew against that for a while when Abby was really young and it's, it's come up every couple of years. We'll all just get hit hard, but it, it's, it's true. And, and also Steph's just a gracious, beautiful, compassionate person. But um, that's hard. That's it's hard to feel like you're living on credit rather than debit. So, um, well, like so true. yeah, thanks. I, you, you're, you're not making more wealth, but you're living on that wealth for that time when you're going through something hard. Um, boy, and then what, what Will said, um, this is when Will and I became friends through Michael Robillard. He he really he really had just a really unfair, rough go. But I had a similar thing, and it was after Abby's big brain surgery, less than two months um, in, in April of 2020. She'd just gone through a hemispherectomy in the school that I worked at, was praying for. And then within two months, they'd fired me in that BLM summer. And it's like, well, I, that's fine, Steph. Now, this is something I, I like. Well, I don't care about. I'll, I'll, I'll suffer the, the, um, fatuously, uh, bad repute of of petty petty peers or whatever. And, and doing stuff on the internet had already thickened my skin for what happened at my job, being fired and and gossiped about in really fair and untrue ways. Like, well, um, so I, I my my skin got thick, um. I think around the time I left Taylor Marshall's channel, cause there's just lots of, lots of petty nonsense. And um, it's like, I don't care. I, I want the truth. I don't need the, the high esteem of strangers, just the high esteem of a, a few people, you know, that, that share a, a telos or a view of the telos with me. Yeah. Sick. Well, I know you got to go, man. Uh, thanks cool. guys so much for this discussion. Uh, I'll see it's you. It's been a good one. Week. See you next time guys. Good Take one. care. God bless Bye. you dudes.